Hello and welcome to Veritas Live. I am your host the most, Anthony Cusimano, back again to take you through another episode of this live show. Now, today's episode is all about digital compliance in a world of risks. But before we get into that, as always, you know the drill. Let us know where you're from. Be sure to post in the comment section exactly where you are from, where you're hanging out today, and let us know and we'll give you some shout outs. Uh, and be sure to also use this opportunity to ask questions throughout the stream as well. Now, that's enough about you and me. Let's take a look at who our guests are today representing the digital compliance experts out there. So up first, we have Eugene Schlotka, a territory manager of digital compliance here at Veritas. Where are you from, Eugene? From Chicago. Awesome. Here they have great hot dogs there. Also with us today, we have Rick Krieger, a senior principal product manager here at Veritas. Where are you coming from today, Rick? Hey there, Anthony. Uh, I'm in Phoenix, Arizona, sunny Phoenix, Arizona. Ooh, it sounds hot out there. Uh, lastly, we got Jim McFarland, our security expert. Where are you coming from today, Jim? Good morning. I am coming to you live from Minneapolis, Minnesota this morning. Fantastic. Glad to hear it. All right. Now, we know where you're from, but to be quite honest, I don't know you all very well. I don't know anything about digital compliance very well. But before we learn about that, I'd like to learn about you a little bit more. So we're going to start with a quick icebreaker. As many of our, our viewers know, we're going to put you on the spot with a fun question. So let's start in reverse order. Jim, if you could have any superpower, what would it be? Um, definitely flight. You know, in Minnesota winter, right around oh, February or so, is to, to jump in the air and head down to the Bahamas. <laughs> that would be my superpower. <laughs> so not only flight, but uh, fast flight, faster than uh, commercial. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> Rick, what would your superpower be? Wow. Uh, time travel or the uh, remote control that Adam Sandler had in that movie. Click, I think it was. I think it's just cheating. That's like God powers right there. <laughs> good, good pick. Good pick. Master of the universe. I like it. Lastly, Eugene, what would your superpower be? So I got three dogs in the house right now, two of my own watching a friend's one. And uh, I got to say, I, I'd like to have some sort of dog whispering powers uh, to keep them <laughs> quiet more often and uh, not act up as much. So that's what I'm going to roll with. I, uh, I think I'd have to agree with you as someone whose dogs constantly interrupt Zoom meetings. Dog whispering would be great. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks. Great superpowers. I uh, love that we all had unique ones there. Flight, time travel, dog whispering. Uh, you know, I'd probably just go for invisibility or something where I could just disappear at will. Why not? Um, and speaking of disappearing at will and hiding things, I mean, that's not the best segue in the world, but I think it is, uh, it is apt. In a world of digital compliance, we, you know, we're talking about how to stay up with regulations, compliance, security, all of those things and things that remain hidden. I'd actually like to start with a question, just sort of a, a primer. What are we doing to stay ahead of the game in regards to digital compliance today? And what are some best practices we learned so far? I'm going to start with Jim, but I want to hear what you all have to say. Um, sure. I think, uh, wow, where, where, where to even start? But um, just coming from Minneapolis, we had over 200,000 employees uh, within a few weeks moving from a corporate uh, locations down to their uh, personal homes which is great that we could continue with business. But from a compliance perspective, especially when it comes to monitoring, it's a challenge. Um, I think that migration uh, results in what I call a loss of a line of sight. So as a supervisor, you can't necessarily see what platforms your employees are on. Um, so one of the things that the firms that I've worked with in the past is you really need to, in that new environment, really uh, have a strong education program so that your employees understand and know what they're allowed to use that, that, you know, if you're in a monitored environment where you have regulations that the, 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 the software they use has to be monitored and approved by the firm. Um, and so education programs and attestations are really important for firms to do that, to make sure that employees understand that. Uh, also, I think a best practice following up on that is monitoring. So you have to look for what I call signaling in your, in your existing message streams. Are you seeing signals that either your employees or your clients are trying to take that, that conversation offline to a non-monitored uh, channel. 
Um, so that's important to, to update your lexicons and, and uh, other monitoring devices to, to look for that. And then finally, um, enforcement. So if you do find employees that are having these critical conversations that's not on your, your firm's monitored networks, you have to be willing to step up and take some disciplinary actions and, and show both the regulators and your employees that there's some teeth behind your policies. So, you know, that could be warning memos, that could be additional supervision, or if the case is really egregious, it might actually be termination. So you need, as, as a owner and a compliance person in your firm, you have to have uh, strong safeguards in place in this new environment. Now I know why they call you the security expert. Very helpful <laughs> uh, overview there. Uh, Rick and Eugene, anything to add to that? Yeah, I, I just say quickly that uh, what Jim's coming back to is um, it's good compliance. So this is digital compliance. So it's having uh, or data governance around your data. Um, you know, you need to embrace these remote employees and deal with them where they are. They're not going away. And if you just kind of put your head in the sand and don't think that these uh, these uh, data sources are going to be around for a while, you're mistaken. You know, you have to kind of embrace them and do exactly what Jim said and uh, address them head on. Yeah, I couldn't, uh, couldn't agree more with uh, both of you guys there. Um, as you guys know, that the world of business communication has really changed and, and COVID has increased that. I would say statistically, email is, is being utilized less and less uh, versus platforms like Teams. I mean, uh, one of the stats I saw recently is in the last six months, um, Microsoft doubled their Teams uh, user growth to almost 75 million. Uh, users. So uh, taking into account all the different uh, collaboration channels that uh, regulated customers might be using. So uh, whatever system, whatever platform you're using to supervise those communications um, should definitely uh, be able to, uh, you know, sort of capture and, and look over those, those communication channels, not just email. Great points all. And what better evidence to everything you just said than us running a live show from our own offices. Uh, speaking of where we are right now, I just want to give a shout out to some of our audience members. we got folks coming in from everywhere today. Saudi Arabia, Los Angeles, California, Pune, India, Istanbul. Glad to have you with us all. Thanks for being here. Now, Eugene, you mentioned Microsoft Teams, and I think that kind of gets right into our, our next uh, question, which is more about the state of things as they are today. So on previous episodes, we've talked about Kubernetes and cloud, and everyone knows I'm kind of the cloud guy. I'm really curious, how is hybrid cloud affecting digital compliance and how are organizations getting to manage visibility and regulations within this environment? Let's start with Rick, what's your take on this? Um, yeah, I mean, the hybrid workplace really disrupted everything. I mean, we went from a place where, you know, you had a couple of people out there, uh, you know, it was kind of an oddball thing. You had remote employees, they were kind of necessity, remote salespeople and, some other technology folks, but then COVID kind of threw us all right into that. And, uh, and not just the, the end users, but the actual organizations managing that. So it was a, a big dilemma for them. They had overnight, you know, people that were uh, using either uh, sanctioned or unsanctioned communication channels. And uh, that gets back to the data governance that we were just talking about before. But, you know, for, for the security and compliance folks, it was tough for them because, you know, the data is stored in yet a different place that they don't have control over, they can't enforce their specific policies for it. So it was uh, a big deal. And actually one data point I'd like to share too is that uh, we were looking at um, the proliferation of teams around the time of COVID here. And uh, I gathered some data and we saw, you know, exchange messaging kind of, kind of going along, trickling up a little bit as COVID happened. And then we had Teams chat trickling up as it happened. And then we implemented uh, Teams voice and video. And it was just this big hockey stick that, you know, the, this new data source went out there and it was, had to be done. It was done in a controlled way, but it was done quickly. And I could see that probably freaking out a lot of uh, financial customers and uh, having to make sure that they're, they're governing that. And maybe they didn't have Teams, they didn't have a good chat, like a group team uh, company chat. They may have had their financial chats narrowed down quite a bit but now you have people reaching out and trying to get their tentacles into talking to people lots of different ways. And I think that was a, a, a big challenge there. Very insightful. Eugene and Jim, any additional takes on this, this hybrid cloud situation we're in today? Go ahead, Jim. 
Yeah, I, uh, it was a real challenge for the firm that I'm in where we were in the securities industry and um, uh, our, you know, our, our employees wanted to keep engaged with their clients and not all the clients had the approved software that, that the firm had monitored. So for example, Zoom wasn't really part of our platform and so we had to uh, rush to figure out how to incorporate that in in order to continue to service those clients. and. Um, it was tough because I think we had a lot of employees that said, you know, I really don't care. I want to, I need to take care of my clients. This is a crisis. And um, one of the things that, that Rick mentioned is there's a big difference too, between tracking on electronic messages, things that are written. I think there's a general regulatory expectation that if it's written, it needs to be stored and, and monitored. Uh, voice in our world really hasn't gotten there yet. And I'm actually kind of glad for that because, you know, the volumes there would go up dramatically. Um, there are certain capital market groups that do have voice recordings and monitoring. For the most part, wealth management isn't there yet. But uh, talking about you know um, uh, Microsoft Teams and WebEx Teams and Zoom Teams, et cetera, I think the next area that there's a struggle with how to capture and monitor is just the whiteboards. You know, anything that's written, um, I think the regulators are going to be pressing hard here in the next couple of years to say, look, if it was written and it was part of this meeting, then you have to retain that and you also have to show that you are monitoring what was being written and shared with the client via these new platforms. And I don't think we're working on the technology there, but I don't think it's already there yet. Very Yeah, Jim, we saw stuff. that with some well, other customers asking scary. about whiteboards. Yeah, there was a lot of interest about whiteboards too. And the other thing too is transcripts are almost coming for free now too. And then now that's written. So uh, that yeah. makes things a little more interesting as well. Are you it just, it goes whiteboards back. here? Uh, actually, no, it's usually it again, it's embedded in the conference. It's usually embedded in the conference. So it's something that maybe a, an FA or someone that's that's using something to point out something to a client. Um, uh, and again, it's it's one thing when it's, it's a conversation, but if they're actually pointing something with electronic whiteboard to their clients, et cetera, there's an expectation regarding retention around that. And not just retention, but again, are you able to monitor? Or is there is there a language or in our world, promissory language is really, you know, <laughs> forbidden. Uh, is there language in there that, that needs to be reviewed and monitored? And um, that's where you're constantly trying to do this catch up game to make sure that if you can't monitor it, you really shouldn't enable it. And then once you do feel that you're, you're able to, to monitor it, you need to do some testing and then obviously uh, include that as part of your, your monitoring program. Yeah, I mean, to add a little bit to that, uh, what, what Jim mentioned and, and, and Rick as well, I mean, you know, think about all these different platforms, you know, you've got your Zooms, you've got your Teams, you've got financial platforms like Bloomberg. Um, you know, the challenge for the, the folks in compliance and supervision that have to review these communications, especially for regulated customers, is having a central location where they're able to review all these different types of communication. And so I think historically, um, those those sort of review uh, activities have been sort of siloed um, in, in different systems. And I think the 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 systems or platforms that are going to really shine. Um, and as Jim mentioned, you know, regulators are definitely going to take a look at you know different types of activities like whiteboarding and collaboration. I think, uh, like I said, the the, the systems that are going to shine are the ones that are going to be able to take all these different communication channels and really centralize it into a single repository. So the folks in compliance um, or, or security or IT have a single uh, uh, search point for all these different communication channels. I think those, those are the platforms that really are going to uh, make compliance easier uh, on the reviewers. Very helpful. Yeah, and no, I actually, I'm, I'm definitely. I've actually got kind of a go ahead. live example of that too. Sorry. <laughs> no, dynamic. go for it. Um, you know, we we were the same the way um, where we were we when we we went to a centralized model. So beforehand, we had like 50 different people reviewing emails and IMs and all of that, and it's kind of garbage in, garbage out. And so we went to a program where we decided to consolidate that, and, um, and instead of going to 50 people, go to four people that we called doing triage. And using the technology that was available, though, you know, we, were, we started off, we were at 80,000 messages a week, which is just an overwhelming volume. And so using the existing technology of, of intelligent review and, and um, uh, whitelist and other things like that, we took that from 80,000 down to about 15,000. Um, so suddenly now it's much more manageable as far as the weekly volume. And, and the, the flip side is we actually found more items. So whereas before, 
we had, you know, with that 80,000 program, we were lucky if we found one or two items per week that we need to follow up on. But once we got the noise out of the system, we ended up getting between 25 to 50, what we call messages of concern that we would then escalate to the local supervisors for additional review. So going back to Eugene's point, it's just the volumes will not ever decrease. They're just going to continue to increase. And it's so important then for firms to leverage the available technology to, to filter out the noise and get down to, what, again, what I call conversations of concern. You've got two people interacting and there's language or a sentiment within that message that, that indicates that maybe a manager or supervisor needs to be aware of what's going on. That's, that's your end game in this environment. That is super good to know. And you've got me, you've got some questions really in my mind. But before I ask those, I just wanted to remind everyone in our audience, if you have questions, these are the guys to answer them. So be sure to post them in the chat. We are happy to pull them in and, and bring them up here and elevate them. And if you're curious to learn more after this show, do check out our posting that we will we will show on the screen right here. It's all about our digital compliance portfolio update. If you want something tangible to read through do check that out. Now, before we move on to our next topic, uh, and just in case we do have those audience questions, I actually have a question based on everything y'all have just said. As someone who has sort of no background in digital compliance, I have no monitoring or managing of it, what, what should I be doing as just an end user to help folks like you out? I'll say something quick and I'll let Jim go there because he probably prays about this every day. Um, you know, the... Uh, Best thing for an end user is stay with, try to stay with, get your job done, stay within your lane in terms of the communication channels you use. If you go outside of that, you're probably violating company policy, which is not good for your career or your livelihood. <laughs> and you could be putting your firm at risk. Um, and then if you see a need, like I did, you now I, I brought something to my IT group and they took it on board and they actually uh, brought it on board uh, properly and they enabled it. So. You know, raise it. Yeah, maybe it won't get uh, taken up, uh, but at least if more enough people bring it up, uh, then they'll expand their sources. I'll do yeah, my it's that's a great point, Rick. I, and it was interesting for for us too. Is you know, the the technology continues to evolve, and there's always new platforms that are people are anxious to embrace, and that's that's actually good. I mean, we we always have to be moving forward, but it's so important that those things are properly vetted. They have to be brought onto your platform in the right way. Um, you know, a bad example in, in my past is there was a, a new platform that everyone was really excited about. And they thought that by blind copying the central vault, that everything would be fine. And that started off as a very small project, but it quickly started to grow. But when we started testing those messages, they just weren't right. They weren't being properly placed into the vault so that we could actually re retrieve them or retain them or have them run against the lexicons. So, um, I'm not a, a naysayer as far as new technologies, but but you have to go through your your firm's technology group to make sure that they're supported and that you can defend those as it relates to any type of regulatory activity. Um, you'll go back to Anthony's point is, is, first of all, again, sorry, total lecture here. Make sure you're familiar with your company's policies and procedures. That's where it starts, right? So play by the rules, know what the rules are. If there's another platform you want to bring on board, then again, bring it through the appropriate committees, see if there's a value there. If there is, I'm sure that your IT department will figure out a way to eventually onboard that in the proper manner. But just realize in this new world, your messages, your activity is going to be monitored and it's forever. You know, it's like a tattoo. So if you're having that bad day and you're having that negative interaction, just think twice before you hit that enter key, because I've seen things come up two or three years later where you know either myself or someone's having to sit in front of a regulator trying to explain how or why someone said something in an email and it's really uncomfortable so people sometimes take it almost too conversationally think about what you're writing think about what you do before you hit the enter key because there's no going back once it's sent jim i never want to think about my team's messages as a tattoo ever again <laughs> but uh, i think you've changed the way i type now so thank you for that <laughs> So speaking of the scary future, uh, Eugene, I want to have a question for you. What should we expect when it comes to the future of digital compliance in terms of both regulations and challenges? Yeah, I mean, you know, if you think about what's been happening over the last few years, uh, data retention as a whole uh, for companies has, has exponentially increased. Uh, regulations um, sort of concurrently also 
uh, have been increased, and, and we we see that trend um, going forward as well. Um, so um, I, I think from from a, a, a compliance perspective, I think especially for firms that are that are regulated, I'm talking about your financial services, uh, government, uh, healthcare. Um, I think there will be even uh, more strict uh, supervisory and, and and compliance related policies that that companies roll out in order to sort of reduce their uh, their risk for 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 fines and things of that nature. So. Uh, as long as you know the the trends stay stay as is, meaning data retention is increasing, regulations are also increasing. Um, I think uh, compliance related policies uh, have to go hand in hand with those two trends. Um, so you know that's that's kind of what I see in the future. So when it comes to those increasing regulations and trends in compliance, Rick, what can a company like Veritas do to to help out with these challenges? Oh, wow. That's a great question. Um, so, I mean, it goes back to what we were saying before about uh, first starting with doing the right thing and implementing good data governance. Um, but obviously, Veritas has a, a line of solutions that called digital compliance that covers all this. And, you know, you're looking at at a high level. Um, you want to you want to identify the content sources. You want to capture them. You want to index them. You want to make them searchable and discoverable. If you're in a regulated industry, you probably need immutable storage. So you want to do that as well and do your proper supervision on the content. Um, but the key thing is staying ahead of those content sources and, uh, you know, the genie's out of the bottle with uh, COVID and remote workers. It's not going away and there's going to be a lot more of that coming forward. So uh, if the regulation is not there for you, you know, there's, um, you know, there's a bunch that that you could and should be doing and it may be coming your way. The other thing I'd like to add too is uh, that, you know, if you're not in a regulated industry, don't be afraid to do something unthinkable. Like, wow, you know, there's these solutions. Some people have to do them, like the financial industry, but um, regular non-financial institutions can uh, take advantage of this by doing just quality assurance with users, uh, HR. There's lots of other applications that you can you can use for monitoring and actually get the sentiment of what's going on for users in your environment and then use that data. You've got all this data coursing through there and no one in the business is actually looking at it to get any value from it. So why don't you get some value from it? Not so much in a big brother way, but to try to stay ahead of things and uh, yeah, extract some value from it. As a little brother, not a big brother. <laughs> <laughs> yes, little brother. <laughs> I love uh, it. I'd like to throw, I'd as like a, to throw as one a big idea brother, out I appreciate there. the call. Oh, yeah, go for yeah, it. Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, you know, using the ex existing technology, one suggestion I'd have for firms is I'm a big fan for testing, right? So, so make sure you're leveraging and make sure you understand it. Work with your vendors. But on an annual basis, you got to do testing. Make sure that the message streams that you think are being captured and monitored are actually there. So one of the best practices I've seen in the past is, is going to your legal departments, your dispute resolution departments and finding real examples. Here, here are either letters or emails or messages that were sent in that needed to be addressed and scrub them for any client information, any sensitive information, because you're really looking for the language of the letter and then run that through your systems. You know, see if that works. You know, in my past experience, when we've done that. The good news is 80% of those messages were detected. You know, they were identified. And again, it's it, it's a little bit after the fact, but you're getting to it very quickly. Um, but 80% were detected. And then for the 20% that weren't, we went back in and we dissected those messages to, to say, what is the language or what was the content that we missed? And then from that, we actually supplement or update our hot words, our lexicons to include that so that we have confidence that going forward, that message would be captured. So if that becomes part of your practice of your firm is the annual testing and refreshing and evolution of your lexicons, it won't mean that you'll capture everything. That's an impossibility, but it puts you in a very strong position to be able to defend what you've done is from, a, from any type of regulatory investigation aspect to say, look, it is, it's a best efforts and here's one of the practices we do on an annual basis, actually test and verify our, our hot words, be alive examples. I mean, what doesn't make you bulletproof, but boy, it certainly helps you when you're having to, to be on the other side of that table. I'm, I'm sure Jim, many in our audience are taking awesome. serious notes right now. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't agree more. Super awesome. And, and honestly, to all three of you, 
Thank you so much. This has been such an edifying and educational episode for me. I can't imagine how our audience is, is feeling right now. Hopefully they all took something away. And I do want to give y'all one more shout out uh, for those in the audience. If you'd like to learn more, we're doing a webinar coming up on September 29th to learn exactly how Veritas is providing enterprise level advanced e-discovery for enabling compliance and peace of mind. So be sure to sign up for that and check it out. We got even more experts on there, just giving more stories and, and telling you how you can stay compliant, stay regulated and stay safe. So that's it for today's episode. I wanna thank you all for joining me again to our experts. You've been phenomenal and incredibly educational. Thank you to our audience for joining in and listening. Thank you for posting where you're from and bringing us, bringing us all of your insights. Our next episode is going to be on October 5th and we're gonna be dealing with how to future-proof your Kubernetes environment and how it's creating the hybrid the modern hybrid landscape. And be sure to join us if you're gonna be at VMworld or KubeCon, we'll be at VMworld on October 5th to the 7th, and we'll be at KubeCon October 11th to the 15th in the flesh. So be sure to stop by and say hello. Thank you again for joining us. Be sure to stay safe out there, stay compliant, stay regulated, stay governed, and stay classy. We'll see you next time. Thanks guys. <laughs>